going to be talking on the challenges I've faced with maintaining a six-year-old library. So it's still active. We still have things to it. Um, yeah, it's getting quite old. So what's changed since it started, I guess, and why are we doing things about it now? Um, so here's the agenda. I'll start with an introduction, and then I'll talk about some of the things we've done right. It's still going after six years. We still have users. Uh, it must do something right. I can't just run for this whole session. Um, and then I've got some challenges that we faced, and finally some of the future what I just need to do to kind of fix the things that I like. So an introduction. This is me. Uh, that's what I looked like before starting this project. I'll leave it to you to decide if it's changed me. Uh, I'm an RSE in computational maths. So my badge says mathematical RSE. That's because they asked me what I wanted to be called and I got to pick at random. Um, and I'm also a developer in the HSL team. HSL is uh, much like IBM. It doesn't actually have a meaning anymore. It once meant Harwell subroutine library. Um, and it's a math software library. So it solves linear algebra. It's free for academics, it's written in Fortran. Um, it's written by researchers who I'm sure you're all familiar with, just want to write the next one for the next research paper. And the funding comes in for the new things, not to maintain the old things. Uh, it's been going for 60 years. Since then, the company that our group sits in has changed two, three times. So a copyright's a complete mess and we don't own half our code. Um, and it's a mono repo with 141 packages in it. So what's it do well? It's fast. Uh, we're recommended by IPopt, which is an optimization um, tool. And since it's really low level linear algebra, that's how most of our users find us and they have to install HSL and they don't know what it does, but they install it anyway, because it makes it run quickly. Uh, it's well documented. The people who have historically written the packages have been very careful to write really good latex documentation. Uh, whether latex documentation is the right thing to do these days, bit of a question, but it's, it's pretty good. And so, yeah, usable. Um, and now we get to the bit that might feel a bit more like a rant. Um, I'm sure you've all wanted to present a rant about some of the Fortran code you've worked with, but I get to. So these are the topics I'm going to talk about. I'll start with language. It's written in Fortran. That's not a bad thing. I'm a big fan of modern Fortran, but we do still have some Fortran 77. And there's a picture on the screen. If anyone's struggling to read it, don't worry. It's just showing Fortran 77 and the kind of dated syntax. Um, so the, I guess the question there is, when do you say this still works, so why fix it? And when do you invest the effort to actually upgrade to modern Fortran? Uh, then we've got some docs in TSSD. This is a format no one will have heard of because it was developed at the same time as Latex and didn't get the user base. But we wrote it and some of the docs were written in it before we saw the light and switched to Latex. And then finally, new interfaces. So we're always adding interfaces for, well, we want to add interfaces for every language so everyone can use it. It's not that straightforward. We've recently added interfaces for Julia for some of our, for most of our packages. Um, but that's because someone came to us and said, I want to help you do this. Uh, can we collaborate? Uh, we don't have interfaces for every language. It's hard to decide which ones need them. This is a bit about Fortran, in case anyone thinks it's a dead language. This is the popularity of Fortran over the years in terms of the ranking of most popular. So lower is better. Um, <laughs> so it was third in 1993, third most popular language. Then it slowly got less and less popular. And then recently it got much more popular again. Um, about 28, uh, 2003, there was a paper that was highlighted recently, which is uh, exploring the risks of still using Fortran when people think it's a dead language and is therefore harder to hire for. And I'm not sure quite what the reason for Fortran popularity uptake is again, but one of the things that happened uh, is the Fortran line community started in 2019, and I'm not gonna try and say it's cause, but it's correlation. Mm -hmm. 
testing, right? So these are our unit tests. In two years ago, I decided to put our unit tests in some continuous integration and see how they did. So 141 packages, these are the percentages of them that actually passed all the tests. So two years ago, 80% of our packages were passing the tests. Um, and that's the, the kind of yellow, orange, and gray are pa uh, packages passing the unit test. The blue is all of the different places you can put a version number or a date for the version, and are they consistent? <laughs> <laughs> so we had 20% of our packages where you could reliably say what version it was. Um, a year ago, it's looking much better, but still not quite there. We fixed everything for G Fortran. That's the easiest to get hold of Fortran compiler. And so we focused on that. And then today, we finally got all of our versioning consistent, which I'm pretty happy with. Uh, and we still have some issues with some of the compilers, um, but I'll get onto a reason for that in the next slide. Um, so this is how we test our code currently. It's using the same way of testing that we've done for a while, which is you run the test program, it spits out an output using print statements, and then you diff that output. And then you look at the diff and you say, this is wrong. Um, what I'd like it to do is, oh, sorry, this is a picture of the diff. So this is a test that failed. It failed because in Fortran, you can have negative zero, which I think we'd all agree is zero. Um, <laughs> but it's not happy with it. And then it tells, this is what, if you run make check after you install it on your computer, this is what it says. It says, please email them. Uh, we don't get that many emails. Presumably people see it and go, yeah, it's close enough. And then this is how I want it to work, where it actually returns an error code and you can put it into CI without having to use diff. Um, but it takes a while to refactor all the code to do that. So moving on to building, originally we had a big bash script that does everything to do with building. Um, this was changed to a Python 2 script before I started. I know it was changed from bash to Python 2 because I read what it looked like. Um, and then when I started, uh, Python 2 was being deprecated. So I switched it to Python 3. And it's about 3,000 lines. And these are the things it does. So you can build the docs, you can run the tests, you can generate make files, um, put a release on the website, that kind of thing. I'm still not sure having a big Python 3 script that just does it all is a great idea, but that's what we've got. And these are some of my gripes with building onto the next round. Um, we had an auto tools build system, which just didn't work. And we had this third party HSL build system, which someone else put on GitHub. And then it turns out it was just easier to say, have you tried using their build scripts for our software, uh, which do work. Um, I also got lots of requests for Windows binaries. I'm not an expert in cross compiling. Every Windows binary I've made only worked on my machine. Uh, and that was made using msys2 mingw and I've wasted a lot of time on that. So the nice version of that is we've now got a proof of concept for some of it using Meson and Binary Builder. If anyone does cross compiling and you haven't heard of Binary Builder.jl, look it up. It grabs all of the different dependencies you need and then just spits out a shared object that you can uh, use. And then there's also Fortran Package Manager, which has been mentioned a few times. It's maybe not quite there, but it is quite easy to use. And I kind of want to support the development. So I'm hoping we're going to have build scripts written in that, even if they're not great. Uh, Git and GitLab next. This is a quote I got emailed to me from one of my colleagues, uh, not too long after I was making everyone use GitLab. So I'll read it out. Um, I'm just about going nuts here. I assume we do have to use GitLab to update HSL codes, and I quite like the automatic testing, but everything I try on the various recommendations goes deeper into some GitLab mire. Um, he's still upset with it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I keep trying, but uh, I think there's a couple reasons why this happens. So 
the two main ones I've highlighted is, I don't know who told him, but git commit minus A is awful. And uh, yeah, I don't know how he found it, but I was cross when I found that out. Then there's um, the difference between rebase and merge. It's hard to explain. You can spend ages on the topic and it's still clear as mud. Uh, we tried using pull rebase so that when you do when you pull code, you um, use rebase instead of merge. And it makes the history look a lot nicer until someone forgets to turn on that option. And then it makes the history unrecognizable. Um, we also have just a weird quirk that always annoys me, which is when you go to the repository, the first thing you have to do is CD into trunk, which is a hangover from using SVN at some point in the distant past, but it's not really a reason to change it other than that it's just a bit annoying. And I put everything into GitLab CI. Um, it helpfully just told me that the YAML file didn't work. It didn't tell me why, it didn't tell me where, and I was using Kind of nested YAML files, so the the uh, uh, online tool for handling YAML files just didn't help. Uh, it's just a bit of a warning. I don't have much else to say on that one. So licensing, um, we're not free open source. We sell licenses to uh, companies for incorporation or just to use it. We give it up um, out to academics freely. And um, we kind of want to change this, but we can't because of the copyright issues that I said before. <laughs> and the people we share a copyright with, we got into that deal so long ago that they don't really care and they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> so the, the only way to get out of that is to rewrite everything that they have any copyright in, which are usually the bits that everything else depends on. Um, because they're the bottom of the stack. And we also make our users uh, request it via a download form, which doesn't feel very modern to me, um, especially not when you can go elsewhere and just click a button and you've already got it. You don't have to wait a day for someone to approve it. Um, web presence is the next thing. So I joined the team and the website was written in Django. Uh, in Python 2 as well. It was not maintained. No one really had any interest in maintaining it uh, because they're all researchers and wanted to do research, not web development. Um, and also this search engine optimization, which I'm not convinced anyone knows anything about, but we certainly don't. So this is what you get when you search for HSL. Uh, for anyone who can't read it, it's a chairs website. And you can find us, uh, I think I, I think I used Bing for this, so maybe that's skewing the results, but you can find us and we're on page nine, <laughs> <laughs> which, yeah, doesn't feel great. Uh, so I need to learn some search engine optimization and somehow get us higher up that list. I think we're higher on Google, but it's still not great. And we also have absolutely no presence on things like Stack Overflow. We recently... Uh, searched for our software in Stack Overflow and found a load of questions and complaints and rants. <laughs> Mostly about how to install it. And the answer was always go to that third party tool. So I've probably blazed through this too fast. Um, I think I talk quite fast when I'm presenting, but um, I'll tell you about what we're planning to do next and I'll slow down for this bit. So we're going to rewrite all of our tests. Um, the tests, as I said, they don't have return codes. Um, they just spit out the diff. And sometimes it's got minus zeros in. So we want to um, have a pass or fail. And then we want to rewrite all of the LaTeX and TSSD uh, documentation in RST and use something like Sphinx. We want to put in this new build system everywhere. We've currently got it on the main product, which is a collection of our packages that works with that uh, optimization software, but we want it for everything just so that it's more straightforward. Rewrite code, which we don't have copyright on. There's 
so much to unpack there that I'm going to put it in a tiny box and not worry about it until later. Um, we have many different packages. They're all written at different times by different people. We want to standardize the format of that um, to make it easier for users so you can drop in, replace them. Um, Fortran doesn't have C prepros, uh, doesn't have any generics, so we're going to use the C preprocessor. At the moment, we're maintaining single and double versions. Um, and then these two kind of come from, I think, the first talk of the conference where we don't really talk to our community. We uh, we give them the software if they're lucky. And um, I, I think we want to change that generally in the group. So uh, why now? And spoiler, it's RSEs. So we got new staff. I only joined the group recently. I only joined it because RSEs are now a thing. Uh, before that, you got hired specifically to write math software. Then there's external collaborators who are RSEs. They, um, someone reached out to us earlier in the year and wanted to help us write software. So that's kind of helping other projects. So we're seeing free open source everywhere and that's influencing us as it probably influences many other projects. And then just general hype around RSE, the fact that it's growing in profile and this kind of RSE technical debt, I guess, is being highlighted. So that's everything I had. Thank you very much. Questions. So the first question we've got, this kind of refactoring, modernizing is hugely valuable, but hard to show what you have spent your time on to non-coder researcher PIs. How can you make this work visible slash quantifiable, e.g. your graph of test passing or counting lines in build scripts? Yeah, um, it's a great question. We, I, I mean, first of all, counting lines in build scripts, I don't think is necessarily the right thing to do. Uh, lines of code is a terrible metric, but it's nice to have numbers sometimes. Um, our group leader is one of the people who works on the code himself. So he kind of has all these headaches as well. Um, and he's got a vested interest, I guess, to fixing it. We also managed to highlight it a lot by just pointing out emails that we get from users who are struggling with things, uh, installing on Windows, for example. We had a lot of emails from that. So we can point at that and say, we need to do work to fix this. Um, yeah, uh, I hope that answers it to some extent. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question, is HSL the same thing as NAG or are these two different Fortran numerical analysis libraries? Yeah, so NAG, um, they actually license some of our software for some of the things they do, but they are separate from us. Um, they yeah, they write a Fortran compiler and I, I don't know entirely what's in the library, but I know that they license some of the code of us. And I think one package in particular. Um, but yes, we are different. Um, yeah. Right, thank you. What kind of testing frameworks do you use or is it all custom? If custom, is there any plan to move to a standard? Yeah, we have custom tests for each package. So it's it's barely a framework. It's just write tests for each package uh, in one giant test um, program, also written in Fortran, and print out results after each test. And then I guess the framework is that we diff those results using our 3000 line long Python um, build script thing. Uh, so that tool, I guess, is the framework, but I, I would love a more standardized one. I'm just not sure if any of them are quite there in Fortran at the moment. I think someone mentioned PF unit earlier in the week, which I might have to look up when I get back. <laughs> cool. Uh, I like this ne next question. How do you keep sane working with what I assume is a horrible code mess? So the the short answer is the people who wrote the code initially are still in our group. So um, <laughs> a lot of the time, if you don't understand it, you send them the email that you got asking why it's broken and get them to tell you what to reply. Um, 
it's yeah because it's evolved over many years um it is differing levels of i guess what we'd call modern software development um but yeah i i guess i maybe i just like the pain of reading through old fortran but <laughs> i don't know sometimes it's better than the alternative of writing documentation <laughs> Okay, we'll take one last question and I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation, I apologize. Why Mizon over CMake? Um, they both do very similar things. I think there's, uh, CMake probably suffers from the same thing that Fortran suffers from, which is that um, it's people think of it and think that it's old or not very good. I think modern CMake's quite good uh, and easy to use but no one in our group really knew CMake or Mizon. And then the external collaborator who wanted Julia interfaces helped us write Mizon. So it's just what someone knew, I guess. We did look at them both and we thought there wasn't too much in it. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Another round of applause for Andrew, please.